Is it song? Yeah, it's a, a bit. Yeah, it's a. She a Jennifer Danette Dell and she a. Logan Schlaw, she him bushes chain, kill a cheating dash a chay, twa head leaning dash another. Twa head chain to a. I see that nasha. Do bell deals in the other. I should not nish not a. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Jennifer Danette Dell. I am of the Zia or Weaver clan. My fathers are of the Salt clan. My maternal grandmothers and grandfathers are Red House. My paternal grandparents are water running together. My home community is Tohatchee on the Navajo Nation, and I teach at the University of New Mexico. And I'm by training a historian. So I'm very grateful and appreciative of the opportunity to be a part of this really wonderful project and this exhibit. I want to thank Susan Schoen Harjo and MNAI for the opportunity to be a participant uh, on this treaty project. And I'd also like to remember um, the Standing Rock Sioux Vine Deloria Jr., who kicked down the gates of, Iv of the Ivory Tower um, so that indigenous scholars and educators like myself um, could begin to be a part of great exhibits like this. He proved of me because he thought Native historians had important functions toward the support and per perpetuation of tribal nations. Um, the, I want to start with or focus my talk around the cover of this book, uh, of which we'll be doing a book signing this evening at 5. Um, the cover of this book has on it um, a depiction of my great, great, great grandmother's weaving. Um, and the top part here is, as you can see, um, a US flag. The bottom part is what's known as an eye, as an eye dazzler um, because of the brilliant colors and the use of artificial dyes. It's been dated to um, 1874, and it, uh, the, uh, staff at the Smithsonian Institution um, discovered that it was part of its collections in 2002. And so I, when, when I came here on one of my research trips, uh, one of the archivists mentioned to me and she let me see um, the textile, which is part of their uh, collection. Uh, in this textile, and there's photographs of my grandmother um, in, in accompanying the essay that I wrote um, for this collection, uh, the photographs that exist of this photograph of this um, textile were taken probably during an 1874 Navajo delegation to Washington DC uh, probably the organizer and planner of the Navajo delegation to DC was my great 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 grandfather who in Navajo is known has to, is known as Hastikinch El Hajine um, who was one of the most um, public and most um, uh, had the loudest voice of objection first to Mexican and then American invasion of Navajo um, homelands and territories. Uh, and so uh, these photographs then um, show my grandmother being part of the delegation um, to Washington, D.C. in 1874. And I have no doubt that um, the Indian agent who accompanied the all-male delegation except for my grandmother um, used my grandmother um, as part of his exhibit of a beginning to develop um, Indian arts, um, Indian arts and crafts um, that was developing at that time, an interest in that. So, um, at different stops, uh, in when the delegation um, took the train from Santa Fe to Denver and then to St. Louis and to D.C., at each of those times, um, the Indian agent took out uh, Navajo. Um, things that they had made, like, for example, the weaving and different things. Um, and so I'm sure he used my grandmother as also a, de a depiction um, as he began to promote um, Navajo arts and crafts. So uh, when I showed the cover of this book at home to my own people, I was struck, and I'm still thinking about what this means, I was struck by a Dene man who looked at the cover of this book and he said, well, it's not traditional. <laughs> I was struck by the remark and it stays with me and marks not only moments in our historical past, not just our relationship of what the Treaty of 1868 means, but also of the transformations that we as Diné have undergone under American 
colonialism. My great-great-great-grandmother, whose public Navajo name was Estantluge, which means woman, um, woman from Zia or Lady Weaver, and I've recovered this her Navajo name during my research, lived through some of the most brutal times um, for my people. Um, she lived during the United States' um, uh, brutal battle and the subjugation of my people, uh, and then the forced relocation of our people to a concentration camp, which is called Huelte, in 1863. My grandmother fought bravely alongside her husband and her relatives. She lost children to the slave raiders who counted on Navajo captives as part of their rewards when they fought the American war to subjugate the Diné. My grandmother surrendered alongside her husband, Husqvinch Ilha Jinnah, in 1866 to the Americans. She endured the forced march to Huelte, the concentration camp at Fort Sumner. She endured starvation, loneliness, heartache, sexual violence at Huelte. And then at the tr upon the, tr the signing of the treaty in June of 1868, she returned with her family and her relatives to our beloved homeland, Dene, home, um, Dene Bikeya. And so all of that, my grandmother's history, um, gets marked by, well, this is not traditional enough. <laughs> okay. And so I determined that nothing, whatever we do in the 21st century as Diné, um, will never meet the standards of um, whatever tradition and whatever authentic authenticity means. And so it doesn't bother me. Um, it's, so then my grandmother, this, this um, the meaning then of the significance of American Indian treaties, um, and I'm really thankful for this day to reflect upon Native nations and our people's reactions to the United States and, and the symbol of what these treaties mean. Um, there are moments as we gather together as representatives of tribal nations to share our histories. We talk to each other. I heard um, several people this morning talk about Haudenosaunee, for example, um, relationships to um, the United States. Um, it reminds us also of our long-lasting kin relations to each other. And it also is a reminder of the United States, um, reminds the United States of its moral and ethical obligations to its indigenous nations and its indigenous peoples. And so I really appreciate also this morning's um, panels when um, the law professor gave a survey of American Indian tra tre treaties and his comparison of the 1868 Fort Laramie tra Treaty and the Navajo Treaty of 1868 because they were all, they were both signed um, at the same time. Um, and he mentioned that they were um, boilerplate um, treaties that pretty much said the same thing. So. Um, one thing then that is remembered by my own people, by, by the Diné, of the, of the meaning of the Treaty of 1868, um, for me, because I, I followed through um, once I found out that actually my great-great-great-grandparents um, was a prominent Navajo headman and that his wife, my grandmother, always was with him for the most part as he went about um, ensuring Navajo land claims that this treaty then and the 1864 Navajo El delegation to Washington DC reminds me of my ancestors' long, long, long devotion um, to Navajo land claims. Okay, when he came here in 1864, it was to persuade President Ulysses S. Grant um, that he should um, pay attention and he should um, support Navajo claims to land, and that, to the end of his life, was what he cared about. In the Navajo delegation pictures of 1874, there was only one woman, which is my grandmother, and so we don't really have a lot of um, indications of what women's participation was in treaty negotiations. And it just turns out that, you know, as you do your work and you become public and you write, um, your own people will come and share stories with you and ask you questions. So came about that a Diné man from Navajo Mountain, which is one of the most traditional um, areas um, on Navajo land, came to talk to me because he was interested in Navajo history. And he asked me if I knew anything about the role of Navajo women during the process of the negotiation of, negotiation of the Treaty of 1868. And I you know, didn't really know a lot. So then um, he told me that the women uh, that... Uh, to come see Sherman, the negotiator on behalf of the, of the United States government, 
um, was very adamant that the Navajo people were to be sent to Oklahoma, to Indian country. You know, um, and that was one of the things that was being negotiated in this um, treaty in 1868. And he told me that the women, the Navajo women came forth and they very successfully persuaded their men leaders that under no circumstances were they ever to give up on that point, that they were not to go to, Indi to Indian country in Oklahoma, but they were to return to their homeland, to Tenepikeya. And so that glimpse of women's presence has really inspired me, um, that we did have a role in talking to our men, that they might have been the public um, presence, but they always listen to us. Okay? And so that also um, keeps me on my trail of looking at and considering what the importance of women are in leadership roles on my nation. Um, and so then uh, in the present then, some of the things that I mentioned in my essay also include court, court cases that are about the support of Navajo sovereignty and self-determination. Uh, I mentioned a couple of um, court cases there. Uh, we, we, we remain under assault as indigenous peoples. We are less than 1% of the population in the United States. We control around or less than 3% um, of, the land base, of the land base, whereas we had at one time had control of 100%. And that 3%, because we have the misfortune of still having valuable natural resources and water rights, um, remains under assault. So then I am also, one other thing that I'm very proud of is that I am a commissioner on the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission. This is the first ever human rights commission that any tribal nation has ever established in the United States. Okay, so um, several of the presenters this morning mentioned um, indigenous um, presence, tribal nations presence at the UN. And so the Navajo Nation has pursued that formally by uh, establishing this commission. We regularly send um, delegations um, to, the human, to the United Nations. Um, we do not have a voice on the floor or a vote because of our status as um, uh, uh, being under the, the United States. Um, we did have, however, just recently word that the Navajo Nation now has um, consulted status at the United Nations. Okay, we don't have to go to an NGO anymore to uh, present our case um, on the UN floor, and that's, that's a really wonderful thing. So um, then when we think about an international forum and uh, under the United Nations and seeking a presence as um, tribal nations that are akin to any other nation um, in the world with the same um, sovereignty and self-determination respected, um, then some of the things that we also continue to strive for as a Diné nation is to enact Diné fundamental law, which is a, a form of governance, a form of laws, regulations, cultural traditions, language, based upon our own principles of Sa'ahna Raibik Ehwajon. We continue to determine for ourselves what, to determine what um, such concepts as free, prior, and informed consent mean. Um, we also um, take treaties uh, to be a reminder of the possibilities for creating a tribal nation of our own choosing. Okay? And I want to end with a story that my, um, when I did my, the, the essay that I did is also based upon um, the work that I did when I first started out as a graduate student. Um, and had no clue what I was doing. And um, went to interview my great-grandparents. Um, and, uh, and it turns out to be a lot of trying to, figure, trying to find out more about my great-great-great-grandparents, and primarily my great-great-great-grandmother, because we are a matrilineal people. But one of the stories that was shared with me by my grandmother and all of my grandparents who I interviewed um, have now, have since passed on. So my great-great-great-grandfather, who's also known as Manuelito, um, to fulfill the education provision of the Treaty of 1868 with the United States government, um, to send our children to American schools um, for um, education, sent his own two sons 
to Carlisle Indian School in the 1880s. Within a few months, one of his sons died of the diseases uh, that were um, rampant at Carlisle School. Upon finding out that his son had died, my grandfather um, insisted upon the return of his other son, who, di who um, died soon after coming home. Um, and when he uh, prepared his, his son's funeral service, he had um, all the people who came to this funeral service. And he told his people, he says, you probably think that I have done something bad or have done something evil because I sent my son to Carlisle Indian School for an education. I did not intend for it to turn out this way. I was thinking of our future, and I was thinking of Inna. Remember what I told you at Fort Sumner at Huelde. Inna don't it. Life does not end. You know? And so from, with that story, his, father, his, his son said, many times my father would be overcome with his burden of responsibility to the people, a need to keep our land, that sometimes he would sit there all night long and have an, with a huge headache, probably a migraine. And he says we would make tea for him. And by morning, he would have calmed down. You know? And so that with that story, I always think about what our ancestors had intended and what kind of vision that they had for us, that we would continue as a people and we would continue as a nation. And so that's what the stories mean to me, and that's what I would like to leave you with as I reflect upon the Diné Treaty of 1868. Thank you. <laughs>